I don't want any answers and I don't want any solutions either. I just want to see the questions. That sounds like a very strategically strategic way to draw out the answers and get the other party to think without offending them and saying, hey, why are we doing it this way? Or why is a protocol like this? And it is really about upskilling people and bringing in new, new skill sets the company doesn't have. Atif Rafiq has been a trailblazer in Silicon Valley and the Fortune 500 for over 25 years. He rose through digital native companies like Amazon and later held C-suite roles at McDonald's, Volvo, and MGM resorts. As the first chief digital officer in the Fortune 500, he led McDonald's digital transformation and recently served as president at MGM Resorts. His first book, Decision Sprint, is a WSJ bestseller. You've got to keep keep trying and explaining why it makes sense. And then obviously once uh, people feel the value and they want more of it. I mean, when you have like a pop-up where people could be put on a BR in 2014, find themselves in a Happy Meal box and then have to figure out how to get out of it, how you know, like technology and digitization could help the company, and not only from customer experience, but from a branding and you know, sort of creating a fun uh, aspect. Did you get a lot of resistance from, uh, from the McDonald's implementing things, or they were just open to everything? There's a reason why you're hired in general, and it's because you have some ingredients the company feels like it's a puzzle piece, you know, or maybe like 10 puzzle pieces in here, one of them, but it's missing, and that's what they want. The Avenue of the Strongest is a podcast dedicated to exploring the lives and experiences of the most inspiring individuals from around the world. Each episode features interviews with fascinating guests who share their insights and wisdom on a variety of topics, including education, impact, motivation, health, and learning. Here are your hosts, Aniette Chowdhury and Vlad Suleiman. Atif, welcome to the show. It is a pleasure having you. It's a pleasure to join you, Aliyah. Thank you. I kind of want to start the conversation. Uh, back in 2013, you joined McDonald's as the first chief digital officer. Now, obviously, bringing digital innovation to a company with a long history and established traditions like McDonald's I assume would be a significant challenge. Uh, large corporations often have deeply ingrained processes and systems that can resist change. So I'm really curious to start over here. When you took over this role, and I, I, to my understanding, it was a brand new role that you took over as ch chief digital officer as you started. What were some of the biggest challenges you faced in introducing your strategies or reinvigorating their strategies for such a well-established brand? Yeah, so I mean, yet, um, just to give some context, 2013 is the year Mark Andreessen coined the phrase, software will eat the world. And every Fortune 500 began to think about, wow, well, how are we going to get disrupted enough from traditional competitors, but like, how are the you know, forces of technology going to reshape uh, what we do for customers and our business models? So I was the first chief to loss her actually in the history of the Fortune 500. It was never a role that had existed before. Um, and so obviously there was a lot of things that I had to do for the very first time. Uh, the context for McDonald's was it wasn't growing. In fact, it was shrinking. Mm -hmm. And that's not a good thing for executives, you know, especially at the top. There's a lot of heat. So the pressure was on from day one for help, uh, to, uh, for me to spearhead the growth strategy of the company, which is really what I uh, was charged with delivering. And, um, you know, McDonald's has been around a while and it's generally a very successful company. And so you kind of can't come in from Amazon and say, Hey, you know, everything you're doing is wrong and here's the right way to do it. Um, what you have to do is be able to connect in the North star, uh, it's what I refer to as what good looks like and paint that picture, but connect it to what the cup, what got the company to that stage to begin with. So for me. I always spoke in familiar terms. That was one sort of uh, how, uh, ingredient in the recipe is talking about convenience. And so at our board, I would talk about the fact that, you know, McDonald's is really about three things, taste, value, and convenience. Mm -hmm. And a third one, which we're going to reinvent for, you know, for the next couple of decades. And we're going to, we're going to lead around convenience and customer uh, experience and, thinking about what that customer experience of the future is, is how I got the company to open their eyes and say, yes, okay, 
what could that look like and how can we make that happen that's how we got the ball started does that make mm -hmm. sense yeah no it does it does did you get a lot of resistance from uh from the mcdonald's implementing things or they were just open to everything well i mean you get a lot of resistance you know um on a lot of different things you know i think in the beginning everyone wants to fill the vacuum of what's the what's the ambition you know what does good look like um and then i think you know the first resistance you get is oh thanks so much for that we'll take it from here um because we already you know operate restaurants so thanks for the vision we you know we'll bring it to reality but that's not that doesn't make sense for a number of reasons one is if you knew how to do it it would have been working um, but, but it wasn't and the second is really about upskilling people and bringing in new new skill sets the company doesn't have so i was definitely the first person in the fortune 500 outside of tech companies to bring in the notion of product thinking and product management i mean people would scratch their head what is this guy talking about product product management and product thinking you know um uh, things like um experience design and all these were very novel things uh, design thinking uh, approaches so i had to introduce these as the nuts and bolts of how you go from the idea stage to the concrete things that you are building um i was the first person in a non-tech company to say that you need to hire engineers mcdonald's so near well we have a process engineer they tell us if the fryer is working or if the <laughs> oven is you know we have in the word but no like software engineers and they would scratch their head you know, these things are now common in all the fortune 500 i mean we got hundreds of engineers in every Fortune 500 company doing software development, but it's very hard when you're the first one and you right. know what it could look like. And you're trying to convince people who are saying you are literally insane. Let's get this guy <laughs> out of here. But you've got to you've got to keep keep trying and explaining why it makes sense. And then obviously once the people feel the value and they want more of it. But I guess at the end, it, it it was quite rewarding after they realized that <laughs> this is what actually needed to be done. There are definitely a rewarding parts. I would say those would be, um, but when, when you're changing a company that's really stuck in its ways, you know, you, you, uh, your reward will first be external, if that makes any sense. You will get the validation and affirmation in the market, less mm -hmm. internally the market will speak you know you'll have like we we brought mcdonald's to south by southwest three years in a row the first year was okay semi-disaster second year it was the the best brand it was voted the best brand presence at south by southwest how does something go from being like why are we there it didn't work to it worked great is because you know it made sense i mean when you have like a pop-up where people could be put on a BR in 2014, find themselves in a Happy Meal box and then right. have to figure out how to get out of it. You know, they began to see uh, how, you know, how, you know, like technology and digitization could help the company and not only from customer experience, but from a branding and, you know, sort of, um, you know, creating a fun uh, aspect, right? So you begin to get your validation externally and then sort of internally people you know wake up to the fact that wow okay you know this is this is what the customer wants right this is what the market wants and then they then they begin to lean in and support this podcast is sponsored by argo prep an award-winning educational publisher serving over a million students nationwide if you're a kindergarten to eighth grade teacher or principal be sure to check out our supplementary workbooks to get your students ready for standardized state testing we cover all subjects from kindergarten to eighth grade Use the coupon code AVENUE for a 25% discount off of all purchase orders. Visit us today at argoprep.com slash store. You, you've obviously worked at a lot of uh, big companies and top companies, and obviously you have a very extensive uh, career history here. So I wonder, what are some of the good leadership what does good leadership look like when, when you jump or when, when you s switched companies uh would you often find yourself having to change you know your nature of leadership style or was it did, did you keep that consistent i just out of like sheer curiosity 
Well, I think, um, I mean, I would keep it consistent in general, just because, you know, your strengths are probably why, why you were higher. So <laughs> I think, but it's a really great question actually that you've asked because I work, I mentor other leaders. And I think one thing they struggle with is, you know, when they come into a new role, they see a different culture. Should they adapt right. their style to it? Yeah. Because, and they think, you know, it's, um, there's a reason why you're hired in general is because you have some ingredients. The company feels like it's a puzzle piece, you know, or maybe like 10 puzzle pieces in here, one of them, but it's missing and that's what they want. So I think you, you know, it's hard to realize and that wouldn't say I, I knew this right away either. It's like to really s stick with that and bring, really bring that to the table. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I think it's, um, it's very important, but, um, at the same time, I think, you know, building in some understanding of how the culture works. Like if people are not familiar, like if you go in and you start asking a lot of questions and it's not because you're stupid, but because you want to plus up the conversation, right? Like right. someone was thinking about something, but when you ask a question, then they think a little bit bigger about it. Right. That's why I ask questions. But in the beginning, they may think, oh my gosh, we hired the wrong person. He has no answers <laughs> on <all the> questions. <laughs> so then, you probably do need to clarify things, you know, it's like, yeah, I'm going to ask some questions here. It's not because I'm not tracking. It's because I want to take us even beyond this. And then mm -hmm. you ask your question, you know, so you have to find a way you have to, um, kind of, um, meet the culture where it is. I think by clarifying your intention behind your style. That sounds like a very strategically strategic way to, draw out the answers and get the other party to think without offending them and saying, Hey, why are we doing it this way? Or why is a protocol like this? <laughs> you got to do it. You know, questions, <laughs> leaders are really That's, there yes. to ask the right questions. Correct. You are spot on. Now I got to talk about your book congrats, by the way, I know you have a, a, a published book called decision sprint. So I kind of, and, and I, and, I, uh, my first question is going to be what inspired you to write the book, but I kind of have a good idea from your previous answer. You, you kind of uh, gave some inkling to it, but uh, please let us know what this book is about, because I do have some great questions I would, I want to ask uh, that pertains to your book specifically. The reason I wrote the book is to scale what I know or what I was fortunate enough to learn along the way. And I felt that it, it's definitely a, a big gap in the marketplace, whether it's you know, <clears throat> a traditional company been around 80 years or a new company been around five years and it's growing, growing like a weed and, you know, it's sort of chaotic. You know, I think both have this gap around um, how to um, do what I call upstream work. So let me define upstream work. That's what the book is about. Um, upstream work is basically the stage between the raw idea or objective, like high level objective and getting to like recommendations and decisions um, because ultimately you need to make decisions in order to move on to action and execution and everyone cares about execution and action so they can see the results but you need to navigate decision making now the counter into the thing gentlemen about decisions is that the tables are set way before the decision point so you could be making a decision but that is really too late in the game the tables are set further upstream it's all the steps leading up to decision making and there are many steps and i end to end to refer to that as upstream work so i found many teams many companies struggle with it um they don't know how to do it well and and there's a lot of pitfalls you know things like oh it was a big idea but they shrunk it down they just mm. something that's so insignificant and a, kind of a yawner right or you know the idea had a lot of momentum but they didn't do a good job with the upstream part. So when it came time for the buy-in, they didn't get the buy-in, right? So the idea kind of fizzled out or there's fits and starts. You know, these are not all, these are not only not good for companies and getting momentum, but they're actually very frustrating employee experiences. So these kind of places are not fun to work at. So we don't want that. We want momentum, we want growth. We want it to be at a place where things are happening and employees are happy. So how do we do that is we have to have an approach for the upstream work. And I can of course walk through a lot of details around that, but 
is really what makes a place like Amazon Excel because they're comfortable in the upstream stage where there's a lot of ambiguity, there's a lot of unknowns, but you've got to have a way to work through that. Yeah, I like the I love the fact that you pointed out that it causes uh, employee fr frustration. And my wife used to work at um, well, actually I won't name the company, but they were a very they're a hyper growth company, uh, massive funding behind them. But one of the main points was there's a lot of ambiguity in their in the processes, and then you. Know, but usually, usually it happens in the big companies, right? In the small companies, when you just start at startups, when you just... But startups are notorious for uh, ambig the, the founders uh, ch change the task for engineers every every two hours. Yeah, you're both right, actually. That's the whole thing. It's just like definitely not flat on the big company side is bureaucratic and they're like, okay, well, I'll still get my salary at the end of the year or every month, so I don't really care... Um, if we don't innovate, you know, so that's that one. And then any other, what you're saying is also true where, you know, definitely in the, um, personality driven place, like a uh, founder driven culture or just startups feel like, okay, every week is, is totally different. And, and that also gets to be a problem, right? Cause it could lead to burnout and it doesn't feel stable, right? Like you want right. some degree of stability and things. Which is not about moving slow, but it, 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 you know, you don't, you know, it's an excuse in startups. It's an excuse. Fail fast is an excuse. Like if the list of things that you want to fail fast on is this wide or really wide, you'll never get anywhere. You want that list to be as, as manageable as possible. So why not kind of actually think things through a little bit? Because you don't actually need to test some things to have clarity on it. Mm, right. And what you can't test, then you that's what you fail fast on, if that makes sense. Can, can you uh, can you walk us through the framework of the upstream work? I, I know you, 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 you touched upon it, but I would love to kind of uh, understand more. Uh, so we start with this big idea and a lot of ambiguity. Uh, how do, what, what's, what, what, is, what does it look like from there? Yeah. So, I mean, and we can take a couple examples, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's always good to ground the, uh, the work of the team in a problem statement, like what, just a definition of the problem we're trying to solve. So let's take an example. You know, you walk out of the meeting with the CEO of McDonald's. He says, you know what, should we have a subscription for coffee? It kind of makes sense. I mean, like then more people will come in more frequently. They'll might buy some sandwiches. It'll be amazing. Right. And now is like, I, and then the meeting ends and he's like, Hey, why don't you five of you go look at this and come back in three weeks with, uh, tell me I'm crazy, you know, or your recommendation. Right. So it's very common type of thing. So with upstream work, you know, you might craft a problem statement of, Hey, let's, we're going to evaluate the merits of a coffee subscription program. Um, but we want to ground it in some things like, okay, the business case, um, maybe the potential for abuse because unlimited subscription, <clears throat> you know, and maybe if it's operationally like something we can actually pull off or if it breaks things, right? So just getting that clearly defined is um, the first step and it's enough to kick off the collaboration, but the action really begins with what I call surfacing the known unknowns, which is just really questions. So um, getting a great question list is very powerful. If you had, um, for example, if I, uh, an executive at teams, I say, look, I want to check in with you. I don't want any answers and I don't want any and uh, solutions either. I just want to see the questions mm -hmm. and how soon can we have that? Like, you need five days, you need eight days. That's fine. It's all good. But just come to me with that. Nothing, no answers, only questions. They're like, oh my God, this is, this is going to be easy. This guy is, <laughs> it's a layup to work with this guy. And I knew that if I sat with them and made sure we calibrated these questions, make sure we don't have blind spots, we are going down the right rabbit holes, so to speak, that is a lot of progress because now you're going to and give them the space to get to the bottom of it. They're more likely to um, have worked through the right information and, and therefore come up with the right recommendations, if that makes sense. So the idea in the book is really uh, starts with how to build and run explorations, which consists of 
a well-defined problem statement, a great question list, developing things like FAQs, which we use at Amazon, and then using that as a basis to draw conclusions, um, flow through alignment and get buy-in, and ultimately output specific decisions or actions. That sounds like uh, a lot of things that anyone that is thinking about starting a startup should do as well, right? To, f to see if they have a product market fit or even maybe even before building an MVP, if, if it's a software or something like that. But you also have to know what kind of question to ask. You're saying that always ask questions. Do you go over uh, like in examples of the topics and the questions that need to be asked? Because also questions should be the right questions, not just some random. Yeah, I think, you know, you can, um, like in the McDonald's example with coffee subscription, it was, you know, how are we going to define, um, you know, the, the business value is going to be incremental, um, business. Well, what does that mean? It means someone comes more, um, or they come, um, you know, and when they come more, they, they do more than just get a coffee, they get a sandwich or a hot, you know, something that creates profit for the company. Like. How do we think about the value and think about operationally, like, well, how does it work in the drive through? Um, they got to think about things like the abuse, you know, like the terms and do you, do you publish those things? Um, you know, they're going to think about, um, you know, the marketing of it, right? Like, so all the, these are the main major sort of considerations and you want to go have enough breadth and enough depth to your exploration. And that is, you know, what, what constitutes a good exploration. And as you said, Vlad, there's no easy answer to that, but that's, that's what you can meet around, right? Like you don't need to meet with people to get like, Hey, suggest your, your, your questions that you can do over tools. But when you meet, then you can see, Hey, this is the, uh, this is the collective of the input. Are we missing anything? What should we emphasize or wait? You know what I mean? That's how you use your meetings more more purposefully but isn't it uh, delaying the process isn't it better to just go and test it quickly and then answer all the questions so that's a wonderful question because this is the main flaw of design thinking um it's it needs to evolve and it's kind of it was good for its time and i could give you a whole private around like a time when companies were unfortunately like some bozo companies like ge and they were very operationally focused, internally focused, and they did not have customer orientation. And design thinking was a way to package the idea of like working backwards from the customer, which is, by the way, an Amazon principle. They've been doing it since 1996. So it's, it didn't start with design thinking. Um, the tech companies kind of had it. Um, but what, what has happened, uh, gentlemen, is basically, in my view, that... Um, experimentation and testing is a crutch for a lack of thinking because mm. if the three of us can sit together we can say okay let's talk about abuse of a coffee subscription well so what if someone comes if half a percent of the subscribers come you know every single day 30 days in the, in a month and they get this free coffee you know and it's it's a um, it's a loss for the company well, what is the actual cost of that coffee? It's like four cents. Um, and the abuse rate is so low. So under some conditions, like it's a non-issue, you know, it's probably costs more to monitor it <laughs> and write the term, pay some outside counsel, the terms of service, the right to terms of service than it is to main operate to solve for the abuse. So we didn't really need anything to test and learn. We just needed to let collective intelligence flow. And that is the heart of what I'm trying to say is companies don't do a, a good enough job in getting the collective intelligence. But I fully recognize that uh, he had in Vlad that the list of things you can think through will always not be everything. And there will be a set of things where you want to test and experiment. I love that stuff. I always supported it. But let's be smart about it. I wonder what percent of people are able to ask good questions because asking good questions is actually extremely hard. And I know you are an amazing at it, obviously, it, 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 you know, and, and any really good leaders, uh, they really are because what they do, whether it's one-on-one -on -one meeting or leading an organization is simply asking questions. It's not really directing. 
it's asking the right questions. Uh, but it's my, 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 okay. So my question then is it, it's, you know, I, you've worked at a plus tier companies, fortune 500 companies, but the talent pools, you know, in let's just say, you know, not properly funded startups, may, the talent pool might look different. So I, I wonder what percent of people are able to answer good questions. And I'm assuming that we can upskill this. So actually, sorry, Atif, my, my question then is, should companies pay a lot of attention in professional development or PD in, in getting employees to kind of think on that route? And and how can we train them to 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 ask the right questions to their managers or whatever the, the structure is? I mean, even company. to themselves, or even to themselves. Yes. Well, I think um, see, we're not going to make uh, let's say you know a good college basketball player into LeBron James. We're not going to be able to do that. Um, but it's okay because you know if we just have um, you know five good college basketball players good at their role and playing as a team, that's probably going to be still a pretty exciting game to watch on television, you know what I mean? Right. Which is generally what we're shooting for. So what do I mean by this is basically the, um, you know, and if you have a good working team, you have some diversity of how people are wired. So you have like, let's say a very creative, innovative person, you have like a skeptic, you have a pragmatist, you guys are right. nodding your head, so you've seen it before, right? Right. And so... <laughs> Well, the innovator is amazing, but is annoying after 10 minutes because they're not grounded. They're <laughs> off in outer space. And the skeptic is super annoying from day one because they're like trying to poo poo the idea. And the pragmatist is like, oh, that's interesting, but kind of tactical. You know, but the truth is we want it all, you know, and that's where um, if, if you have the right workflow, which is what I write about in the book, where it's like, hey, just give me your pragmatist. What are your questions, your innovator, what are your questions, you know, then actually you will probably get a good breath, you know, of the different things. And <clears throat> the reason why software is important here, and I began a software company, we can talk about that separately, is because if you just do it with meetings other than tools and don't use tools, you, one personality can dominate and take us down a rabbit hole. And then we only hear about all the reasons why we can't do this, thing, right? Right or we're all pie in the sky. But if you use tools, you can level the playing field and you can extract the right contribution from the different members of the team, which I think is the power of it. So to answer your question, I think we, we just need to kind of work with how people are naturally wired and the questions that are natural to them. That's okay. Um, now, you raise a really interesting point about upskilling. If we were having this conversation three years ago, pre-Gen AI, then we wouldn't talk about it the same way but now what is will happen is that gen ai will help people upskill because um you know it's part of the reason we can talk about it separately is i started um an ai workflow company called ritual for decision making um but with things like that you know when you add a question you know or ask a question it gives you related questions so it I know nudges you, it raises the bar on your thinking. And if you do it repeatedly across the different things you're working on, I do believe it starts to upskill people and helps help them unlock their critical thinking skills of which asking questions is one part. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. You've taken a lot of what you've written in the book and then created into your, in, into the company you've started. I, I did, buy, I, I did download it and I was playing around with it. Uh, really impressive, actually. I I, I haven't seen. Uh, it, it's 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 great. I mean, I can see. And you've you've obviously talked a lot about it, but I can see how this is very important. Um, and 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 you're, it's it's a B two B play. Yes. Yeah, so a ritual dot work is the company, and it's a SaaS product. So if you use Asana, or Miro, or Mural, you know it's 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 in that vein. You know, you know, um, a monthly cost per user. Very affordable. If you can expense a business lunch, you can use the product. You know, <laughs> nothing complicated. And uh, but the goal, in all seriousness, is um, is to unlock you know human contribution in the AI era, and that's really my personal mission. Is that um, 
you know, um, I, I think that um, we have an opportunity, we have a moment in time where we could um, not only have, get the help of AI and software tools to help companies move, um, you know, solve problems faster or move ideas forward faster and better. Yeah, that's all good for companies. You know, from the human perspective of like this existential question of does knowledge work mean knowledge workers? <laughs> and my answer is yes. And, uh, and I really strongly believe that. And so we need to like do a better, um, sort of like, um, divide and conquer on like how humans and AI pair together to do this work of problems for companies. And that's really what I'm trying to, uh, that's my big, uh, North star. And of course the, the software ritual is just part of how my point of view on that. And, um, yeah, and I think we're going to be, you know, there's going to be a lot of ways in which companies change in ridiculous ways, you know, um, you know, over the next 20 years. And so we'll see. What's your biggest pain point or currently right now running your own startup? Well, you know, it's usually go to market after you have a pretty, you know, a nice product and users like it is, um, go to market is basically like, you know, are you doing direct sales? Are you trying to do product led growth? And you, you never know for sure. And you're trying, you know, you try to simplify your products. So it becomes a more PLD, right? And, uh, so you try things, you know, and you see if that gets people going. So it's really about, um, it's really about some repeatability, some patterns in the usage that you can build a business on. I want to pass the next question to Vlad, but before Vlad, you asked, I have one more since we're on this topic before we kind of step into slightly another direction in your book. But uh, so what do you miss the most from corporate life then? <laughs> That's a great question. If so, you are. Well, <laughs> so you're right. Like, three years ago, I stepped off the hamster wheel of 12 years in C-suite roles, right? So oh, only twelve oh, years. <laughs> no, I'm well, kidding. On the, <laughs> on the C-suite, yeah, right. Yeah, right, yeah. Right. Well, that's like being one of the top five or ten people, and right, the case of MGM being, you know, number two in the company, that kind of stuff. So, you know, that um, now the good news is what the transition. It, it, it was like I had to dust off. You know, the dust was on my jacket. But I had the jacket because in my 20s, I started a, one of the first cloud software companies. So entrepreneurship is not particularly new to me. It's in my blood. My dad was in the garment district uh, importing cotton from Bangladesh and Pakistan to create robes and towels for Macy's, you know, kind of thing, right? So, right. <laughs> you know, it's kind of in the blood, but once you <laughs> go corporate for a while, you know, you kind of have to dust it <laughs> off and, you know. So to answer your question, yeah, I mean, you know, look, I mean, you have to get everything done in the startup. You have to not only roll up the sleeves, I mean, you have to basically, you have to sketch the wireframe. You have to, you know, look at the figmas. You have to edit the copy. You have to make sure the button colors are ready. You have to make sure that the, you know, everything is perfect. So it's the level of minutia and detail. You have to be able to, um, not just be in the common loop and calibrating, you actually have to do the deep work. And right. I like that, but that is a transition. Yeah, fair that enough. That was the transition. I'm fully transitioned. Because, fully transitioned. You know, we, we only have, you know, you, there's no one to look around to at the beginning, right? Like, there's no one to, it's not going to get done otherwise. Yeah, the, 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 dust, the dust is out right now, right? <laughs> it's clean. Uh, yeah. since, we, since we're speaking about entrepreneurship, I want to touch a very important topic here. Uh, which is uncertainties. And I think, I mean, it touches not only entrepreneurship, but the life in general, because everybody is afraid of uncertainties. And everyone is trying, you know, to meticulously plan. Uh, but if one single thing is just going to the wrong direction, everything is just falling apart and going to garbage. And there is a saying that uh, Jason and David from Basecamp always say that planning is guessing. And in your book, uh, you talk about making unknowns actionable. So my question to you is, what recommendations can you give to teams to effectively tackle uncertainties? 
uncertainties. I mean, I think um, one is some knowingness that you'll be okay on the other side because you'll you'll make the pivot, you'll make the adjustment because you'll you'll always have like, oh well, uh, that wasn't right, but this is now we think this is right. That's part of business, you know. It's like um, you know. Um, if we had to go back and do a paper trail of all the things we thought were right and then what actually turned out to be right, it was probably look like a winding road with a lot of pivots. And so, you know, we have to trust the pivot. The pivot is the main thing in the startup. You know, it's right. like my, only, my biggest regret about my first startup was we only made four pivots. Only. And, I, <laughs> only. Yeah, exactly. and that is and true. Think, yeah. Four is a, only, that's a small number of pivots. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, if I if I think about ritual, we've already made six or seven, you know, and then we're still early. So how many will we make to to yeah. really win and, and, and become reach our potential? You know, it's probably you know a dozen or more, maybe a couple dozen. So I think you know at a micro level, um, I mean, you'll be able to pivot. So it's okay. You have to be convinced that oh, what we're doing right now is the right thing until you know otherwise, and then you have to trust that you'll be able to be able to pivot. And that's actually what makes really good entrepreneurs because they're like going on stage and saying, trust me, Tesla's work three times the card thing because we're making these robots. Trust me, it's coming tomorrow. And <laughs> in that person's buying, it's a hundred percent true, right? Until, until it's not. Atif, I want to actually ask you the same exact question, but to direct it, uh, not to the teams. So again, I'm going to re-ask the same question. Uh, because so, you know, it, it's like in real life, right? Everybody is scared of the uncertainty. So let's just take what, what recommendations do you have for people in general on a personal note? Uh, people are uncertain right now with all of these AI tools coming out. Some are worried about job displacement. Some are worried about robots taking over the world. Some are worried about inflation. Do you have any recommendations for the general notion of uncertainty, that fear on a personal le level? How do we, do we mitigate that? Do we accept it? Any, anything from there? I, maybe it's an unfair question, uh, uh, but maybe any wise words you have to share on that aspect? Well, I, I fully realize that um, you take any individual the wor in the world and there'll be some things in their comfort zone you know, and where they can face uncertainty, like some domains and some which, which are not. And if, you t if those things have uncertainty, you know, people feel like they can't breathe. You know, and it's very this this song, um, this arc, this set of things is different for each human being, right? For some people, it could be location, it could be family structure, it could be job, it could be amount of money they had, it could be almost anything, right? Friends, constellation of those things. Uh, so, you know, I fully recognize that. So I think that, you know, in general, you know, some of the principles that um, I live by, I, I would try to apply the areas where I have that comfort to the areas where I don't, you know. So like, mm. for example, I'm comfortable taking risks because I'm from um, an immigrant family. My parents were immigrants and we really didn't have a ton. So it's like, how much lower can we really go here, you know? <laughs> Not much. So I might as well <laughs> not worry about that part, work hard and try and get more mobility up there. So at some level, you know, there's an advantage there in my upbringing of a comfort level with risk. And, you know, I don't have to, I don't worry. I'll, I'll figure, we'll figure it out, you know, in terms of how oh, if I move from one company to the next and it doesn't work out, I'm not like going to overthink that. Uh, of course, I'll make a calculating bet. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm com I'm comfortable there. I'm comfortable taking risks with um you know like starting a business and stuff like that, or trying writing a book. I never written a book before, you know. So all those things. But I'm sure there are areas where like I'm different than that, right? Where I'm like I I cannot figure out how to deal with uncertainty on right. something else. You know, I'll make it out. Oh, you're a kid going to college, and now you know you you're 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 sad or you're lonely. It's it's you know that's the kind of Everyone has that set of things, um, but my advice would be to 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 see the universal uh, adaptability that you have in the areas where you have that comfort with uncertainty, and then apply those to the areas where, where you don't. You've been able to figure it out, and so you will be able to figure it out in those other domains too. 
Great you know, advice. it's actually a very nice point about the immigrants because a lot of people, I think, should learn from the immigrants because initially they had uns uncertainty the whole life. You know, they came to America without knowing anyone, without anything, maybe even without any money. They came and they survived and they grew. I mean, I would even say grew this country. While some of the people that I know that always been here, you know, they were born here, they are even afraid to move to another state and they are dreaming about it, but they're just afraid of it. Isn't it odd? Yeah. It's odd. In fact, I would imagine if you take your average Poland family in the suburbs, um, their kids are going to complain now. Hey, oh, uh, man, the, um, we don't have the immigrant advantage. You know, we're at disadvantage. So it's it's just all ironic. <laughs> like, you can have all the advantages. You know, you grew up here, you have the wealth, your family has a network, and then you're, you know, I'm kind of just really just joking here. Yeah. Uh, bad dad joke or something, but like, oh, I, I have less advantage than the kid, working class kid of immigrants. You know, but um, it's, um, you know, I, I think that's um, in the long run, it's an advantage. When you were in the moment as an immigrant working class, like you're like, this sucks. You know, we can't afford anything. We don't go on vacations. Like, uh, you know, <laughs> I can't get Nikes, you know, all this stuff. But um, in the long run, obviously, um, it can, you know, for, yeah. for those of us who are very fortunate, probably create some degree of inner resilience that's as passed on yeah i was actually asking myself this question how can i you know teach my children to be you know resistant to uncertainties and i don't remember who we were speaking with on our podcast but this is, was actually one of the advice to change the location where you live because the more you change i mean i'm not saying that you have to change every single month but you, you're changing the the state the location i don't know and kids facing these challenges and where they grow up, it will not be so hard for them to pivot in the companies or pivot if they have their own company or if they work for the company to pivot from company to company if they don't like anything in their life. So they are not getting stuck in one routine, the one that they hate. <laughs> Sounds brutal, though. That's where you make some of your childhood friends and you grow up together and you develop long-lasting relationships. I mean, I mean, I, I, I know I'm, I'm, I haven't read any studies, but moving state to state. I started middle school with for kids. I did that. That was rough for them. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, building I'm, not, I'm not saying to move every single. <laughs> who, needs, who needs friends? Month. Resilience is more important. <laughs> <laughs> but there's got to be something in what Lance saying. You know, travel this that. I mean, you have to think of something otherwise but it's actually very very rare i don't know about uh the majority of the people but i think it's very rare when people have uh, ch uh friends from the childhood it's very rare usually we have friends from the ch uh, from the college maybe from the late school years mostly from the from the businesses uh, i mean from the companies that we work with in the beginning i don't think it's so so important I think stage does matter, so that's true. Yeah. Perfect. So I want to um, ask you the question. So you've had the opportunity to work for various system companies, obviously, and uh, each with its own strengths and weaknesses. If you could take the best elements from each organization to create the Frankenstein's monster <laughs> company, which would uh, what would it look like? Which features or practices would you implement in the company? Well, I mean, just to take a sample, I would say, um, I would say, of course, uh, I mean, Volvo is an interesting company being a Swedish company in a Nordic culture. And so the, the, um, the human centricity of trying to understand where people are coming from, um, and, and making sure people are heard and understood, you know, that's a positive thing. Um, you know, I think that's pretty obvious now in the stage of capitalism, but like, 10 years ago, people would be like, oh, what are you talking about, right? So, so that's a good one. I think from, obviously from Amazon, uh, from the Amazonian days, like the idea of learning and the speed of learning, like you can go into a space, they have no history, pharmacy or, you know, retail grocery, but they learn as quickly as possible. So they're not shy 
around these uh, uh, unknowns and they just try and learn as much as they can super as quick as possible. I think that's a really uh, great thing. Um, I think there's a degree of like in the McDonald's culture of the loyalty, you know, that was, that has been there, which I think is a good, uh, you know, good thing. If you can make, uh, get that going the right way. So those would be some, if you can combine all those things and have them not conflict with each other, you know, then I think that would be amazing. I have uh, two last questions for you. So on our show, we have a tradition where a guest is asking the question, the next guest. So we have a question from our previous one, uh, which is what are you doing to make the world better for the next generation? I'm trying to demystify a sustainable work and, um, you know, I don't want us, I want us to avoid a situation where young people feel hopeless, um, which could come if job jobs shrink or jobs are more elusive to attain. And to me, that's uh, very important is optimism and younger generations that they, you know, that they're growing up, they're getting educated and it's for a reason they'll be able to apply themselves and actually see, see impact, you know, and, and, you know, we, we don't want idle human beings and we don't want, we want young people who can look forward if they so choose to, to work and contribute and have careers and things like that. I think that's really important. And, uh, you know, in a time of disruption, you know, that could be a question mark on people's minds. Mm -hmm. And what would you like our next guest to answer? What's your question to them? My question would be, um, are you living your values in your work? And, um, mm. and, um, you know, what, um, what's holding you back from, from doing that? That's a great question. Atif, what a wonderful conversation. It's been an absolute pleasure. Please share with our audience, uh, what you have going on or any information you'd like them to know or where they can follow you. Sure. So, um, my book is available at decisionsprint.com and there you can read a little bit more about wh what it's about. Um, you know, I'm personally on LinkedIn, uh, like everybody else, I'm, I am a top voice. Um, I have a newsletter with over hundred subscribers it's called rewire. So you could follow me and follow the newsletter rewire on the website. And then, um, for those of you involved in ideas or objectives or you know, helping your companies progress, you know, we invite you to check out the ritual product and uh, share any of your thoughts. So that's available at ritual.org. What a great conversation. And I look forward, hopefully in the future, maybe in a year and a half or two years, we can have a, a, re, a, a separate episode and we can kind of see what the past or two years from now what the journey for ritual look like and the new pivot if that happens or happened uh that that that, that is a great conversation to have so I'm, i i love stories like that so Atif, thank you so much for your time it's been an absolute pleasure uh, yeah i'm glad it's been a pleasure joining you thank you so much for allowing me to share um you know what i have to offer and for these amazing questions thank you